Hello everyone and welcome to this video where we'll delve into four common music engraving mistakes that I see composers and engravers make all the time. These mistakes affect your sheet music on a fundamental level, so even if uh, some details are really well crafted, the overall result still suffers. My name is Frey Bedlen, I'm a composer and music engraver. In my days I've probably produced somewhere around 10,000 pages of sheet music. I work as a freelancer for Breitkopf und Hertel, the world's oldest music publisher, on their highly meticulous Urtext editions, but uh, also work for many different publishers and individual composers. <laughs> Mistake number one, excessive horizontal spacing. This is something that I see all the time, especially in instrumental parts. Beginning and intermediate composers often use too few bars per system, which uh, leads to several problems, really. This isn't the worst case you'll ever see, but the music is very loose. Uh, spreading your music out like this might, for one thing, create page turn problems, but more importantly, it just creates this very awkward reading experience where your eye essentially jumps between notes instead of being able to move smoothly along with the music. And it also makes it difficult to read ahead, establish phrasing, and understand the music in general as a whole. By reducing the previous example to free systems and even adding bars of relatively active material, we get a tighter layout with very little unutilized space. However, you do have to be careful not to go too far in the other extreme, as you might end up with something like this. Here everything is just really crammed together and any accidental severely distorts note spacing. A better solution would be something like this, or if you're really struggling to find the page turns, you could even go tighter like this. Learning this balance does take a fair amount of practice, but generally most beginners and intermediates do lean towards having far too much space rather than too little space. So that's where I would start. <laughs> Mistake number two, not filling the page. This particular mistake often manifests itself in scores, mostly in the vertical domain. I think it stems from, on one hand, not being well versed in staff sizes, page sizes, and page margins, and on the other hand, a lack of just general visual awareness. For this one, I'm just gonna be lazy and use one of my own works, even though formatting it like this hurts every single bone in my body. So while this example isn't absolutely terrible, I have seen way worse cases. Recently, someone in a Sibelius Facebook group asked how to achieve essentially something similar to this, which is just... What are the issues? Well, for starters, like half the page is just occupied by empty space. Sure, paper isn't some exorbitantly expensive commodity these days, but we should strive to use the space we have and generally make the music comprehensible. And while the individual systems are readable enough, the eye has to make this huge jump between the two system, but more importantly, all this white space in the middle of the page is just extremely visually unfulfilling. By adjusting the staff size and page margins, we can easily fit three systems on each page. Now the whole page is put to good use, the systems themselves are neat and compact, and the eye no longer has to make this huge leap between the systems. <laughs> Mistake number three, filling the page the wrong way. So in the last example, we talked about the importance of essentially filling out the page, but it's also important how we fill out the page. 
When working with mid-sized ensembles like symphonietas or large chamber music groups, you might end up with something like this. That usually happens when the composer, whether that's you or someone else, is kind of in between page sizes and staff sizes. You might be using a staff size that is generally okay for that paper format, but uh, due to the number of instruments in combination with your staff size, you just find yourself unable to fit two systems on each page. So what are the actual problems with this? Well, similar to the previous mistake, half or even more than half the page is just empty white space. Just now you've spread it out between the systems. And this even more makes it needlessly hard to quickly get a grasp of the music, not to mention just how awkward it looks. The solution depends a bit on your circumstances. Usually you can actually fit two systems. If we go from this original 5.5 millimeter staff size, 15 millimeter top bottom margin, and instead use 4.7 millimeter staff size, 10 millimeter top bottom margin, we can see just how easy it is to fit two systems onto each page. And to illustrate the weaknesses and strengths of these two different layouts, just look at how far the eye has to travel in the first example to make sure that the violin is a true unison doubling of the oboe throughout. Now compare that with the new layout and it's far more comfortable. And we also quickly notice that the trumpet does not actually follow the line all the way. Okay, but what if you really can fit two systems on each page, no matter how much finagling you do? Well, let's take this overture by Emily Maya and say you want to engrave it on A4 paper without optimization, which essentially just means all instruments are always shown. With the current ensemble size, that works pretty well. You can nicely fill an A4 paper with just one system. But let's say we remove the low brass and make it into more of a classical period orchestra. Now we're back to this uncomfortable amount of white space in the first example. You could cram the beginning of this overture onto one page, but if you have a huge tutti, extreme registers, or as in a contemporary piece, lots of dynamics, hairpins, uh, technical instructions, and so forth, that just really wouldn't work. So the way we solve this is by simply bringing out the bottom staff. We're essentially taking the white space from between the staves and just putting it at the bottom of the page. And this way we can have the system itself be nicely spaced with not too much space between the staves. How much you want to bring up the bottom staff is kind of a matter of taste. I like to bring it up quite a bit because I like compact layouts. Other engravers might prefer a little less white space at the bottom. But generally, if you find yourself with three staves worth of space between your instruments, that is just way too much. And I would, of course, use B4 paper with two systems for this because it's just simply an amazing format. But you might not always have that option, and this is essentially how you would solve it on A4 or letter size paper. Mistake number four, not knowing your staff sizes. This one plays into the previous two mistakes, but it's also absolutely fundamental to make sure your parts are legible. There's many different guidelines out there. Elaine Gold has a chart in her absolutely amazing book, Behind Bars, and uh, that looks like this. However controversial as it may be to disagree with Gold, I think this chart is pretty flawed and kind of confusingly laid out. I guess part of it comes from the fact that it focuses on old school restroom sizes. Anyway, Gould brackets single staff parts as being from 7 millimeters all the way to 6 millimeters, which like 6 millimeters is super small in an orchestra context. On the other hand, I recall some old standards floating around online a few years ago that recommended something like 8.5 millimeters as the default, which that's kind of ridiculous to the other end. The current MOLA guidelines state that 7.5 millimeters is the generally most readable staff size. That's also what Breikopf uses, and 
just generally my go-to default these days, it's pretty much always safe. Some publishers I work with have received complaints about orchestral parts that were done at 7mm, so I think having this at the upper range in gold chart is pretty risky really. Lighting conditions definitely play in here. In orchestra pits you tend to have far worse lighting than in a well-lit concert hall. And for example, the complaints those publishers received were from opera houses. So what this in the end comes down to is essentially the distance from the musician to their music. Composers and engravers sometimes forget the very physical reality that musicians read their music under very different conditions. A pianist sits at the piano with their music almost immediately in front of them, while an orchestral double bassist not only shares their stand with another musician, but also has this huge instrument in front of them, between them and their music. A chorist holds the music in their hands, so their music can be smaller than any other performers, while a harpist, despite not sharing a stand, sits actually pretty far away from their sheet music. And of course, scores are quite a different beast. I think gold listing full score as 3.7 millimeters in that chart we saw is another pretty confusing thing about it. Sure, for a huge Wagneresque orchestra, you might have to use that, hopefully only for a few pages. But if you make an entire orchestra score at 3.7 millimeters for really no reason, you'll really just make the conductor cry. 3.7 millimeters is really small, like my pinky is four times as wide as 3.7 millimeters. With that said, conductor scores can, of course, be far smaller than instrumental parts. The conductor doesn't play. Sure, they do need to be able to read the music in detail if need be, but most of the time they just generally read with a far more bird's eye view. I like having 4.5 millimeter as my lower limit for orchestral scores, unless there's a huge DVC or something. 5 millimeters as a nice ideal, and then kind of 5.5 millimeters for chamber music. But as you can probably tell from learning about the other mistakes in this video, the staff size of the score is a pretty flexible parameter, and you have to evaluate what works for you with the paper formats that you have available. So this is extremely general and comes with tons of caveats, but I do want to give my general recommendations of what you can use for staff size in what context. Feel free to pause the video and just take a closer look if you need to. Finally, I just want to do a quick note on US paper sizes for anyone viewing from the US. And the thing is that US papers are just not very good. You really only have two standardized sizes available, the letter size paper and tabloid size paper. You don't really have a good standardized B4 equivalent. There is this format called legal paper, which at least is taller than letter size, but it has kind of odd proportions, and for scores especially, you won't be able to fit in a lot of music horizontally. So essentially, if you can, try to use something like 10 times 14 inches or 11 times 14 inches. These are great B4 paper substitutes. But as far as I understand, often in the US, you have to kind of make do with what you can access, what you can afford, essentially, and what the orchestra maybe you're writing for has in-house. And as a tangent, A4 isn't really a very desirable format either. Pretty much every orchestral instrument is better off with B4 rather than A4. The one time you probably want to try and use A4 rather than B4 is piano music and choir music, because holding B4 tends to be quite awkward, and on the piano it tends to be quite large. So that's it for this video on the top four mistakes in my opinion. 
These were in no particular order, but I think they affect your music so fundamentally, and I see them so often, that I wanted to focus on this in this video. Making a video in this format is completely new to me. Essentially, I kind of wanted a new hobby, which is kind of funny when you consider that either composing or engraving is all I do for work. But writing a script, recording it, trying to get a little bit better at delivery, and also just video editing has been a lot of fun, so maybe I'll do some more of these in the future. So I hope you got something worthwhile out of watching this, and if you have any questions, comments, just leave them down below. Cheers! Thank <laughs> you.